right. Well, I'll get a setup here. Oh, okay. I always forget that. Most of you know I live out in the country, though I'm here in Falls Church today where the internet should be so much better. But there's issues this morning here as well. I'm not sure what's going on. I think there's been issues everywhere in the last two days. Yeah, well, I was talking to AT&T last night. I was four hours on the phone with them Ugh. trying to get a new box installed, and they, they couldn't finish it. We had to go back to my old system. Ugh. They said there were some technological issues somewhere on the East Coast, but they couldn't pinpoint what the problem was. All these kids logging in for school. Well, oh. you know that, but they said they had this much activity over the summertime with all the live streaming of movies and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and playing games and stuff. So that wasn't, you know, we all think that, but um, not, not, that, not late at night. So, yeah. So. All right. Um, I did want to revisit, uh, let's see, what was it? The internet. There's a few things here under the marketing advertising. I really want you guys to make sure you read it for yourselves and understand what it says so they can advise your client accordingly. I know on some of the homework, and maybe it's something you want to have authorized, but just double check that you do and your client does want displays of blogging and um, this one here. These two specifically, do they want unedited comments and do they want blogging and Zestimates? So be careful whether you do yes authorizes or does not authorize, okay? And always when you input a listing into MLS and to Bright, you wanna make sure that um, you're replicating what the client chooses. Don't necessarily choose it for them. You wanna counsel them and advise them. But um, anyway, so that was one of the things I saw in some of the homework where people put that they authorized the Zestimates and the, and that's okay if you do, as long as your client understands that other brokerages and other people can then blog and make comments about their property and they're not the listing agent. Okay. Some will still try to do it. Again, the, um, I find that this is kind of confusing. So you check yes here for designated and no for dual. I found a couple homework assignments where they said does not consent to designated, but does consent to dual. That so was backwards. So it's designated yes, dual no. Okay, so be careful with that one there. Okay. Of course, if your client doesn't want designated, that means then they cannot look at anyone, any listing that's been offered by our three offices. So that's where you want to really be careful about that. Explain that to them. Okay, we left off here at uh, relocation. We talked about relocation with regards to the buyer's agreement. And um, one of the things I want to mention, and I think I did during the buyer's agreement as well, is that when you're involved in relocation and you're representing the seller in relocation, you're going to double your work up. So always keep that in mind. Whatever you're going to do for the MLS, most relocation companies, you have to replicate that on their online system. So it's all the information you put in MLS gets replicated on their online system. So it's, a, it's double the work. And when you're looking at a home that's 
you know, a million or more, and you're giving away 35 to 45% before your office split, you know, you, you run the numbers and you, you know, you might want to do it specifically if it's for someone who's a, a friend um, and you want to get referrals from it. You don't want to always look at people as dollar signs, but also remember that with referrals, um, there is a, um, there's a hefty price to pay and you're going to do a lot of, you're going to do a lot of work. Okay. So, um, so we're on page 29. Okay. Good morning, Raekwon. So Deb, did you say with referrals, we would end up doing I'm Sorry. <clears throat> Referrals, relocation. Oh, relocation. Okay. I didn't mean referrals. Referrals. <laughs> thank you for saying that. Correct me. Referrals is when someone, an, an agent, either within your office, because maybe you're a Virginia agent only, and they might be a Maryland agent only, or you might have someone from uh, the Falls Church office who does not want to do work in uh, Fredericksburg or even Richmond, so they might refer it to you. <clears throat> Um, that's a straight referral. It's a 25% referral, generally speaking, most of the time. It's always negotiable between the two agents. But generally speaking, we give each other a 25% referral. When you refer someone out, the agent who is the referee, they take over and they represent the client. The referring agent does no longer represent the client. And uh, they really should <laughs> give the client advice either. Uh, because it can be conflicting. We all do business slightly different. And you might say something to the client where another, the agent you refer to might say something slightly different. It may mean the same thing, but then it puts up this, uh, an issue between who do they listen to. And even more so when you're crossing the border, okay? So if you're a Virginia agent, and you're referring a client to a Maryland or DC agent and you yourself are not an agent in those two areas, you are absolutely forbidden, 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 forbidden to discuss real estate with that client because you're not licensed in either one of those jurisdictions. So we've had situations in the past where the agent has said, well, I want to go along because they're my friends and family. Yes, you as a Virginia agent can ride into Maryland and DC as a passenger in a vehicle with your client and that agent representing them, but you are not allowed to discuss real estate in any way, shape or form, okay, at all. Either in the car, outside the car, at home, on the phone later on, because you don't know the laws in Maryland, you don't know the laws in DC. So whereas Virginia gives, for example, three days, the right of rescission on HOAs, Maryland gives five. You may not know that. So you are really hurting your client and your, your friend and yourself because they're really, you referred them out. Let the agent refer them to take care of them, okay? You don't need to micromanage that agent. You chose them for their professionalism. Let them do their job, okay? I've had I have a question that's a little bit related. Sure. Um, I actually was planning this weekend to go. I'm only licensed in Virginia, and I was planning – on going to a couple open houses in Maryland. Okay. A little bit for myself, because I'm interested, um, and also some friends that might tag along. Um, is that something I should avoid, or is that fair game? I, I understand like not touching on real estate like topics with them, but- You can certainly go look at it. You're not representing them as a Maryland agent with them. Just make sure you don't that you have no agreement signed with them to show property in Maryland because you can't. Uh, right, okay. You and your friends can go and look at any open house. That's open as, a, as someone from the general public, okay? Uh, but you cannot discuss real estate with them in Maryland. Uh, you can refer them to a Maryland agent, okay? I know of two situations in the last year where a Virginia agent referred someone to a Maryland agent and they, the Virginia agent kept getting involved. It has created such havoc, okay, um, in amongst the deal because promises were made that promises could be kept because of the laws and stuff like that. It was a, and so it's, you know, and in the past, Steve and I, at our old brokerage, we've had that issue come up a couple of times as is in, like you're doing a listing. So let's say one of your best friends from 
elementary school calls you up one day because they see you on Facebook that you're an agent and they live in Maryland and you're a Virginia agent and they want to list their home and they trust you, they remember you and they've heard good things about you. Well, you'd refer Maryland agents to them to list their home. You cannot say, I'll be there alongside you. You can't, okay? Mm -hmm. That Maryland agent needs to take over. And they said, well, we want your presence here. You can't. I mean, you can certainly go to the open house and stand there with a smile on your face, but you can't say anything to anyone except, hi, how are you? Okay. If you send them, can you, can you forward them listings, say, that you see on MLS in Maryland? You should not. You really should not. Because you're not, you, you don't have an agreement with them to represent them in Maryland. That's kind of, you know, like what, yes or yeah. no. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm, I'm asking because I live in Maryland and I'm licensed in Virginia because I'm born and raised there, spent my whole life there. Um, so I'm having a lot of uh, prospects showing interest in Maryland because I live here. They'll, they'll ask about Maryland. And so I'm having a little bit of trouble kind of avoiding the, the, the don'ts more than the do's. Right. Right. Um, you might want to check with Shannon to see what your limit is on sending information. The problem is you can't answer any questions. Um, that's where you start crossing the line. Um, sending someone a listing is one thing, um, but double check with Shannon on that one, Dennis. Um, yeah. But when someone, so I, we had a, a, years ago, we had a Virginia agent who wanted to market themselves with the Maryland agent her popularity in her mind was so great that it should bring more people to the house. And it's like, no, I mean, she went ahead without asking anybody and had thousands of postcards made up with her face on there as a Virginia agent and the Maryland agent's face. And she also wanted her sign in the yard. It's like, no, 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 you cannot, do it. <laughs> you cannot do it, you know? And I uh, said, so fortunately you haven't put stamps on those postcards because you cannot send them out you will lose your license. You will be fined heavily and more than likely you'll lose all your licenses. And the Maryland agent would have as well for being complicit to the act. When the Maryland agent was a newer agent and didn't know really any better. Um, and so that's why, you know, whenever you come into anything, I'm glad Dennis, you asked that question. And I would uh, defer you to Shannon just to clarify that, you know, uh, look at getting your Maryland license. Uh, reciprocity well thank you for giving the head giving us all the heads up about this because i wouldn't have even thought about that right well it, it's become an issue on on many different levels i've been aware of for almost 20 years now being that we're in this tri-state area so to speak mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> we cross the we cross the border so to speak and we're not even realizing we're in a different area sometimes and that the laws change so when it comes to real estate, it's like you're crossing into a different country. All the laws are different, right? So anyway, so just, you know, so with uh, relocation, that's a one into, and then you got your referrals. And just so, even if it's to a Virginia agent somewhere else, you really shouldn't be advising the client you referred because they should be working with the agent you referred them to who knows that area. Um, and if they have an issue with that agent, then that's another discussion. But uh, just to, just because they feel comfortable asking you a question, and one thing I one thing it bugs me more than anything, and you you guys are all going to experience this at some time. You're going to be competing for a listing with somebody, and you're going to be the uh, losing party, and the other party is going to win. Whether they're the same brokerage or different brokerage, it matters not. It still stings a little bit, especially when you think you have a particular relationship with somebody. And sometimes they're swayed by what they see popularity in media or whatever. But then when things don't go well with them, they wanna call you and talk about the issues with you that they're having with their agent. And you are not permitted to do that at all. You have to simply say, I'm sorry, that's breaching the ethical bounds of what I'm bound under the uh, code of ethics. I cannot discuss your home with you because you're in a, a signed agreement with somebody else. I can't discuss anything with you. And they'll say, well, I just want to, if you think they're doing the right thing, said, I'm sorry, I cannot discuss anything, anything whatsoever. So if they're, what about if they're just talking about like their agent, like 
they seem like trash talking their agent. Well, even yeah. if they're trash talking their agent, you can certainly listen, but you cannot comment <laughs> back. The only thing you can say is, I would reach out to their broker. Yeah. Or I would re, you know, you might want to read your agreement with them. Just reread your agreement with them and see what it states. You know, that type of thing. Um, it, it happens a lot. It happens yeah, a lot. The only reason I said is because I know other agents trash talk to agents a lot. Like I've heard agents before. So. Yeah, people, yeah, there's a lot of trash talking out there and, it, and, and we're supposed to be above that. So, you know, be careful. Okay. So, condominium association, paragraph 17. Sellers represent that the property is or is not located in a development which is a condominium or cooperative. There's not that many cooperatives. River Place in Virginia is one. There's a few others around. A cooperative has a wholly different set of rules. The land is leased. The people basically own the airspace within their unit type thing. So it's a different thing than a condominium. Both can look like an apartment building, but they're also places such as townhomes. And in Alexandria, uh, there is a single family residential area, small area that is managed as a condominium association. So basically the group owns the land and the homes, the outside and the people own the inside of the home. Um, I forgot where that is. I know Gary Firth and I think Bill Armstrong told me about it a couple years ago. Um, but anyway, so be careful when it comes to when you're looking for townhomes for clients, where when you're looking under the financials on MLS, you want to make sure that if they don't want any condominium whatsoever, then you always click fee simple. Because if you just click townhouse, specifically more so than detached, you're going to get a mixture of condominium RAN and fee simple uh, townhomes. Okay. After the crash, I was showing some clients property in Centerville. Walked in this little neighborhood that just had, you know, probably less than 20 home, town homes uh, in this like little cul-de-sac circle. And I was just struck by how many for sale signs were there. And this house, this townhouse was just gorgeous. And the price point was pretty low. And I called the lender and I'm like, something's just not right here. Well, the agent did not have it in there as a condominium. Um, so it was ran by a condominium association. And because so many of them had gone belly up, the uh, lenders were not lending there. So it was basically an all cash deal. And the, the listing agent had not indicated that stuff in their listing. So people were going to see it, but no one could write on it unless they're paid cash. So, um, so when you're searching for your client and also when you're representing your client in a listing, make sure you know, and then you have to say to your client, uh, the moment we have a ratified offer, we want to uh, give the documents over uh, for the condominium association that we are required to do. So you're gonna say that the seller, don't say the broker will order, the seller will order at the seller's expense, this one here, now what I do is I'm taking a listing and I know the client's going to sign as soon as they sign or even at this point, I said, you know, your how to get onto your uh, condo or HOA's website. Let's go ahead and I'll walk you through ordering those documents because you as agents know that you're looking for the resale package. So it's often easier to sit there with your client and do it with them. So it's done as opposed to walking away and, put it on their shoulders to finish it after you leave. So you really would like to have the, the documents ordered as soon as your, this agreement is signed, okay? I got a question. Uh, yes. Um, so working, uh, again, I worked at a title company for years before I uh, right. started this. We always ordered the resale package every time. Um, for clients that when they would send us a contract, we would send out for our own copy of the resale package. Is that, are we, are we ordering well, two or? Did you get, did you, well, most title companies don't order the whole resale package. They order the, um, the cover sheet per se. And, you know, and like in the condos, we ordered the whole kit and caboodle. We got, we would get like the, like the 55 page. I don't know why you would, um, 
I, I mean, now I wasn't a processor, I was a post closer, so I didn't do that. I didn't do that often, but it was part of the, the services we offered. Once they gave us the contract, we're like, okay, we got it all. We're oh, okay, in the past, okay. Now, years ago, agents and other people would call up and order stuff. A lot of that's changed over time because of fraud and stuff like that. But um, that's, why, that's why we don't even say that the broker should order, because you may not be able to. It can only be strictly ordered through the seller's portal, okay? Right. I know sometimes companies have their own, not portal or login, but we just say, hey, we're a title company. And they're like, no, nope, here you go. I mean, we still have to pay for it for the same thing. Um, yeah. But, all right, cool. Yeah, that'd be interesting to know why they would be doing it, unless you're just doing it on behalf of the seller to provide it to them as mm -hmm. a service. But um, I'll ask them. I'll ask them. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Thank you, Samantha. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so the seller orders it, like I said, at the time of listing, you know, you really want to uh, get those ordered right away. Okay, so then, uh, and as you go down through this with your client, and that's why I usually stop right here when we're in the middle of doing this and have them bring it up either on my computer or their own, because um, then we want this information as well. Because you need to input stuff into the MLS. You have to know what you're talking about, okay? You have to know that there's no overdue fees. You have to know if they're current. You have to know if there's any special assessments, you know? Um, and I'm sure none of you have ever ran into this where you're talking to a husband and wife or a couple um, and or partners in something and one says, oh, do you have any special assessments on this? And like, oh, no, no. The other was, oh, yeah, we do because it's the one who pays the bills. The other one has no clue that it's going on. They've probably been told, but it's not what they do on a regular basis, so they're not thinking about it. Okay, special assessments can come up at any time. It could be that a hurricane came through and took the roof off of the condo. Okay, so they've had to put a new roof on. So every unit in there is going to be assessed $50 a month for six months, for example. That's a special assessment. So then you have to know what it is, how long it's for, and what's it for. Okay, that has to be replicated in the MLS. It's got to be part of the contract. Okay. The buyer has the right to know this. So it should be seller shall order it and it should be at the time of listing. Correct. Okay. Yeah, at the time of listing. Thank you. Seller shall order at the time of listing. And the beauty of that is the moment a document is ratified, okay? I mean, the second is ratified. <laughs> the next thing you do as a listing agent is you send those documents to the selling agent or the contact person listed in the contract, which may also be the buyer. And then they have their three days in Virginia. Okay, so they've got the HOA before they even more than likely have scheduled their home inspection. So they can't say, well, we'll, you know, we'll see what the home inspector says. And then we can always say we're gonna avoid on condo documents or HOA documents later on. If they've lost that chance within the first three days after ratification, then it, you know, that's, that's one of those contingencies that's off the seller's uh, plate, so to speak. Okay. And um, they can't, because years ago, people would wait till they had a ratified offer, then they would order the document, which would take 14 days, 14 business days, which is really like 17 to 18 days. So you're looking at three weeks into the ratification period before the buyer ever gets the documents. So you've gone through even the appraisal. You may have gone through home inspection. You didn't like what the seller agreed to, but you know, and then all of a sudden you say, we'll just get out on HOA documents. In Virginia, you don't have to have a reason to void. You just have, once you received, immediately you can void. You just have to receive them. So, um, so that's why the beauty as representing a seller is getting those documents ordered right away. Now, a lot of companies will allow you to defer payment, your seller to defer payment until closing. Now, in doing so, they often ask for a buyer's name. Make up a name. Just Mr. and Mrs. Smith, just make it up. You just fill that in there so that you can get the documents ordered. And it's the full resale package. If you're, if you're in a buyer's market and you order a resale package and the place doesn't sell for a while, 
then you might want to, um, you know, what you have to do is you have to double check with the HOA or the condo association to see if there's any updates to the package. And usually it would just be the minutes, unless it's that time of year that they're doing an update on the budget or something. But um, during that time period, the HOA or the condo association, someone has to go out to the property and to inspect it, okay? And then they're gonna give a list of violations. And you'll see in the contract, and in the HOA and condo language, that the seller is required to fix the violations. So this is something you need to tell your seller. This is another reason you wanna do it as soon as possible. So you get that list of violations, you get them corrected, you get an updated, an updated um, letter from the association that doesn't mention any violations, potentially by the time you get an offer, okay? So that's another benefit, is at least they know what their violations are. Those violations are also gonna come up in home inspection more than likely, not if it's a color situation, that's gonna be a condo or an HOA situation where they've got the wrong color on the house. Will not come up in a home inspection, but damaged wood and stuff like that would come up. So that's- yeah. Good. Yes. Before we move on from condo, so back on the um, special assessments, uh -huh. um, you've only got to fill out something there if it's an ongoing special assessment. Let's say there was a one-time special assessment three months ago that had already been paid. You don't have to divulge that. Correct. Okay. Right. And then the second, yeah. okay, thank you. And then the second- to do with their bills. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, and then the second question is, you, you fill out the seller will order the documents. You said not the broker because the, the term broker is being used to represent both brokers in this case, that, that cooperative relationship. Um, so hence you put seller there, but it, it is the listing broker that would order those documents versus the property owner typically? No, the seller themselves should order the documents. Okay, the property owner should order the documents. Right. Most cases now, they're, they're on a website that they have to sign into. They can't just call up the association like days of old and say, we want to order a resale package. Which, okay. Like in the early 2000s, we as agents and transaction coordinators, we used to do that a lot. We would order packages for people. We would set up and turn off utilities because of fraud and identity theft and all that things like that have all come to a screeching halt um Got it. so that's why and then when you sit there with the seller and you explain to them let's do this now it's off your plate it's not one thing less you have to think about and um and then the fact that it gives them time to come and do the um, check see if there's any violations they can get corrected uh even before it actually goes live on the market or soon thereafter, okay? And there again, if you do have violations and you get a ratified contract, you might wanna go ahead and get the violations cleaned up and corrected and reinspected before you turn over the package. It might be a few days after ratification. And there's no problem with that. It's just not waiting after ratification yeah. this year to order the package. It just takes too long. I had a, uh, I represented a buyer a couple years ago and um, we ratified and I got the package that afternoon, which I thought was great. That's someone else that's on the ball. But then as I opened up the letter from the uh, HOA association, it said order date was that day. <laughs> so I called the agent and I'm like, your order date was today and you're giving me the package? I said, and then as I looked through the package, I said, all, you've, all I have are the bylaws and the minutes and the budget. I said, there's nothing here about the inspection or, she goes, oh, I didn't realize that. So that agent really didn't know what they were doing. They received something from the company and just forwarded it on to me without even looking at it. Okay, so all that, all that company did has sent them all the standard documents, the bylaws, the budget, and they hadn't sent them anything about the, that particular unit. They hadn't done inspection. 
And in fact, the inspection wasn't going to be until the 12th business day. And it was in the letter, you know, <laughs> the inspection will be on the 12th on this day, which is the 12th business day. And so um, I told her, I said, my client and good conscience, we cannot accept these documents. They're not complete. Now there's some, and we'll talk about that later, but uh, so you got to be careful about what you are accepting and receiving and stuff. Um, and then the client does not have to read it. They can choose to void on the deal without ever having opened the package. All they have to do in Virginia is to have received the package. And then they can void if they choose to. Okay. And it's, it's a stinker when people void. Your, your seller gets upset when there's no reason to void. Same with home inspection. You can void on home inspection without cause. The seller can say, I'm willing to fix anything. But you can still void. Okay, and we'll get to that when we get to the contract week after next. Uh, remember, guys, while I'm thinking about it, we're not meeting next week because it's mega camp. Okay? So if you don't know what mega camp is, talk to your PC coaches and your leadership and see if you need to get to mega camp. And I know for some of the offices, I know there are some scholarships available. So please, um, you know, don't miss it. At least listen to Gary's speech on Tuesday. It's, it's, it's really good. So Deb, Deb, I'm sorry, one more. So there, the bottom line is the condo association will keep general data, which is the bylaws, budget, et cetera. And that's kind of the standard documentation that they have ready at, 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 you know, at will. Right. Uh, they also apparently get data on the unit itself, whether it's inspection related data that I guess comes from the inspector or it's, um, uh, of violations that the owner of the unit has had that has not have not been cleared up. So, so as a listing agent, you need to help that seller um, make sure that it's a complete package before it's turned over to uh, prospective buyers. Is that pretty and good? You yourself, right. And you yourself should be getting a copy of it. So when you're online with your client to set this up, you're going to be, more than likely your client won't even want to see it. <laughs> they just want to send to you and off their shoulders. Okay. At least you as the agent is going to receive it. I usually have both the client, the seller and myself receive the package. Doesn't, okay. Doesn't cost anything extra. Um, most cases it's all electronic now, or at least on a DVD, but most of it's all electronic now. Um, especially since COVID places that have been, dragging their feet to convert, have now converted because of touching paper between people and stuff. Uh, one, some of the entities like the Resident Association, they will not let you defer payment, which means you have to pay for it up front. So if you're working with a client in a Resident Association and a few other areas, they may have to pay for it up front. And speaking of Reston and some of the planned development neighborhoods, they may have more than one package. So for example, in Reston, you can live in a condo and pay a condo fee, but you also pay a homeowner's fee to the Reston Association. So you actually have two and you have to order both packages, okay? Anyone who lives in Reston that pays, there's a very few homes in Reston that do not have to pay the Reston Association fee. There's some of the original homes and certain, in a certain area that are exempt. But for the most part, you pay a resident association fee is due usually January 31st, and it's six, $700, okay, uh, annually. And so as a listing agent, you have to know that your client lives in Reston, they have the resident association fee, and then they have their cluster fee, and that's what Reston refers to it as, their individual neighborhoods called a cluster whether it's a condo unit or neighborhood. And then they have to pay fees to their cluster. So it's their cluster who may or may not come out and do an inspection. Rest and association definitely does to make sure in compliance. Um, and, you know, they check for things like paint color and what the yard looks like and, and the trees and all that stuff. If there's decks and unauthorized. So things you're going to get on these violation reports is if the home has the wrong color on it, 
whether it just be a door, shutters, um, a storm door is the wrong style, the deck is the wrong height, the wrong color, the wrong style, the fence, same thing, wrong height, wrong color, wrong style, wrong material. Uh, when someone goes into an association, whether it be homeowners or um, condo, and especially like in the townhouse situation, um, you, if you want to do a particular thing, you have to go and get a design choice. You have to reach out to the association and it's part of your package. And it tells you in the HOA package and the condo package, you have to, if you want to build something in your backyard, like a fire pit, for example, you would have to apply for that to the association to see if they permit it. Sometimes they say you have to talk to the neighbors on either side and across to see if it conflicts with anything in their home or their desire for you to have it. Uh, where that could come into play is if you want to build a deck that might look into someone else's backyard and no one else around there has it. But if both neighbors are okay with your deck being so many feet high that it could look in their backyard and they're okay with it, the association may allow it and it'll be put into the records. If you don't get their blessing for it, then you build it and usually it's only during the time that a property is sold that the violation is noticed, unless you have someone on the board in your area that's one of those, I call them the Gladys Kravitz from the Bewitch days. <laughs> They'll go around looking for violations and then they report you to the cluster, to the board or whomever, and then you get your violation notice. If it doesn't get paid, then it can it accrues on your bill. So that's the other thing that your client has to divulge, do they have any outstanding liens or debts to the HOA or the condo, okay? Um, so some of those can be very tricky when it comes to paint color, you know. Um, so when I lived in Reston, the secretary of our cluster, her printer's ink was not calibrated right. So one of my friends who had a three-story townhouse went and, and what should have been more of a, a light army green took what the swatch that the secretary gave him, went to Home Depot, had the paint done, painted his house. It was the wrong color on the outside. And he had to repaint that house. And if he didn't do it by a certain time frame, he was going to be fined every month until it was done. It was the secretary's fault for having the wrong color. Now, since then, the resident has made Home Depot be the keeper of the, the palette of colors as opposed to the secretaries, but nonetheless, it happened. Wow, that would have been so unfair. <laughs> it was unfair. Three-story townhouse? Really? Three different colors, because you had to have your fascia board, your trim. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's, um, yeah, very strict. And uh, in fact, when I sold my townhouse, mine was just a two-story. When I sold mine, too, it turned out to be a KW agent who's uh, quite the investor, one of their rules was if you had a gutter, because they didn't put gutters up, and we did. If you had a gutter, it had to match the color that it was touching and any downspout. So my house was a light gray. The stucco coming down the wall is like a beige. The fencing is brown, okay? And my violation was that my guttering did not match the surface in which it was touching. So I said to the agent buying it, I said, I'll be glad to paint all this to match. But when it's done, this is what it's going to look like. No, so what it was, what the, what the rules were saying that if I chose to put gutter up, because they didn't have gutter, okay. and I had a downspout, the surface that the guttering, the downspout was touching, the gutter itself had to match that color. So the top of the gutter, they wanted it to be gray, a light gray. So there were three colors. The downspout touched the stucco. And then the, <laughs> then the piece that came across to divert the water from the house was along the fence line. So what the client did was the buyer, who was a KW agent, he signed an agreement to take on the headache himself to get the neighbors to agree to the fact. Because I said, I don't mind having my husband come up here and slap some paint on this and make it three different colors. She's like, no, no, you know, <laughs> he said, you need to take on this, um, this defect. 
and you can work it out with the neighbors and, and, uh, and get the board to remove the violation. He still owns the rental property. I sold it to him in 2003. <laughs> so, um, so property condition. So as you're working with your client, oh, here, make sure you're getting this information as well because you need this for MLS. And you have to make sure that they're current on all their fees. You have to ask. This is where you do have to get into their business. You have to ask, are you current on your fees? And just say, no judging. You know, nowadays you can say with COVID, who knows what's going on out there, but you know. Um, so, and if they have both a condo and a POA, you have to do it for both. Right. So when you're down below, you get the POA, right? Um, so in Reston, some condos, there's a few that do not, like right near the town center, they only have the condo association and they don't have to pay the rest of the association because their grandfather did. Okay. Um, but for the most part, yes, you're going to, so when you're in Reston and any place is a planned area, a PUD, planned urban development. And so you want to always double check with your client. Do you pay fees to more than one entity? Okay. For the Reston association known as the RA, that's an annual fee. The other ones in Reston are quarterly, okay? And by the way, in case you're not aware of it as agents, your HOA and condo fees are not part of your mortgage, okay? Some people have sent, tend to think that it becomes part of their mortgage, it's not. They are separate fees, okay? And the mortgage is for the house. The mortgage is for the house, which includes taxes and insurance, Right. okay? So it's what you owe the bank, the taxes and insurance. Okay. All right. So then property owners association, same thing as the condo. You're asking the same questions. You're finding out there's any special assessments, uh, anything that needs to be fixed. Cameron Station has some units that have both of those. Right. I couldn't think of the other one. Yes, Cameron Station. Right. I should remember that. When we first moved to North Virginia, we lived in Cameron Valley. I sat there with them. Oh, okay. So yeah, Raekwon's question was, how do I make sure they do it? I had them do it with me right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. If I walk away, and a game's on that afternoon, or the kids got a game, or yeah. or they're just tired from spending two hours with me doing a, a listing. Yeah. You know, you forget, and we all put things, you know, the next day. The next day, we'll do it later. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I like to get it done right then and there. And before I meet with the client, especially when you're pretty sure you're going to sign, I always let them know it's going to be a couple hour process, you know, mm -hmm. and then we can make it a two step process. And you'll learn this with your coaches where you might come back another time to do all the measurements. Okay. But really walking through this agreement with them takes time. You're not gonna do it like I do with you guys where it's line by line, but you wanna know it bullet pointed enough. That's why I read it to you and I encourage you guys to go through it yourself. Even make notes for yourself when you're first starting out, like in the margins, what it pertains to and even on a, and you can PDF it to yourself if you want to handwrite notes or do them online with a text box. So when you're talking to your client, you can have your computer opened up and you can say, okay, this is pertaining to this. And you know what your little spiel is about homeowners. You know what your little spiel is about the uh, condo association. You know, if your home, if the home was not built before 1978, you can certainly then skip the lead-based paint. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, on your guys' homework, um, you were representing yourself as the buyer. I didn't really, in, I didn't really um, circle back with you guys, but if you're doing uh, as the buyer, if you're also doing a property that was built before 1978 and you're sending documents to Shannon to double check, make sure you put yourself in there as the agent as well, because you have to sign the lead-based paint disclosure. That is the only document that the Virginia agent signs. They have to initial and sign the lead-based paint disclosure, okay? 
So uh, some of you chose properties and I did send some of you properties that were built in 1978 or before just to see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I sent someone else that one too. So just to see if you caught it, that there was lead-based paint. Okay. So lead-based paint disclosure. Seller represented the property or the dwelling is or is not built before 1978 constructed. So if it was constructed in 1978, that means you don't have a lead-based paint disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Now, Maryland goes even a step further. Then they say, was it built in 1977? You know, you know, <laughs> one of their disclosures. So, um, so anyway, but it's, it's before 1978. So if it was built January 1st, 1978, <laughs> then it doesn't need a lead-based paint disclosure. And we finally gotten past, uh, back in the early 2000s, there were some, some of the brokers in our area that were incessantly making their agents send a lead-based disclosure with every listing, no matter when it was built. Especially when the market around here was really rebuilding and all the homes were brand new homes in all, old neighborhoods and stuff. Only if the home, so if you go into say Pivot Hills and you tear down one of those 880 square foot homes, the years ago, people were leaving foundational walls because it was the tax structure was less, okay? But what happened was, if you left part of the foundational wall there, then you had to declare that the house was built before 1978. So the lead-based paint stayed in, in place. But over time, you know, it was better just, they realized it's better to take everything out and then rebuild. And so, you know, all the plumbing and everything. So, but early on in early 2000s stuff, you would saw a lot of that. You would see some of those homes, there would be brand new homes, but it would say it was built before, like in the 1950s, is because some of the walls or some of the plumbing was left intact. And that was even different than starting from the original house and building out. That's a different situation. May I ask you another question, Deb? Sure. On the, on the lead-based lead -based paint as it pertains to the listing agreement, if the house was built uh, 1978 or later, um, would we still need to include that, uh, just the information document or any part of that lead-based stuff? Nope. We wouldn't need to include that, would we? Okay. And when I'm representing a buyer, and I know we're looking at an area that has predominantly older homes, I go ahead and give them that EPA document so it's done. Right. Start signing all the stuff, saying they have it. They do have it. You know, I just give it to them. Part of, I just send it to them as a separate PDF. I don't attach it to their buyer's agreement, but I just send it to them as a separate PDF, you know. So it's, it's done and out of the way, okay? Uh, okay. So anyway, so the subject to the federal law concerning disclosure of possible presence of lead-based paint at the property, a seller acknowledges the broker has informed seller at the seller's obligations under the law if the dwellings were constructed before 1978, unless under seller has completed the, and provided the broker form. Okay, so one of the things I want to mention, and this happened ironically since we started the KW here, but three times early on in our career here, probably around the 2014, 2015 timeframe, we had three cases within a short time period where um, three of our agents had offered the EPA book to people who were buying before 1978 older homes. And it scared them so much because they came from countries that they never heard about this because it talks about what it, ha what it does to children and stuff. And when your client has that fear don't try to explain that, you know, this home has had all new windows replaced or all new doors. Don't just let them pay for that inspection. Okay. You, Cause you gotta, same with radon, you gotta let them deal with their fears. You cannot talk them out of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, she did that the same flow. Like, she was like, I don't know her fear. Um, but, you know, we were never allowed to just touch the walls when I was a kid. And I never understood it too. Like, I was like, please. She may not want your fingerprints on the walls either. <laughs> Raycon said her mom didn't like them even to touch the walls. And a lot of it's just a fear that you, just by touching or licking the wall, you know, and it was eating the paint chips 
off the steel encasement windows is the issue, the biggest issue. And now there's rules and regulations um, when renovators come into a home and they have the old windows and the old door frames that they have to go through a process they have to be certified to, uh, to take care of those because of the lead-based paint. Okay, this paragraph is one of the paragraphs that I know Shannon could probably scream about as well as I have over the years that agents tend to gloss over. They just don't do, they don't have their clients check off anything and because they, they don't want to ask their clients these questions. Well, it's on the listing agreement for a reason. You want to protect yourself. You know, you can bring up the, the deed online. I mean, not the deed, but you can bring up the tax record online and you can say, oh, my clients bought this house 20 years ago and they paid 300000 for it and in the neighborhood they're going for $800,000 and think, oh, they have all this equity. You don't know if they refinanced or not. You don't know what equity they have. You don't know what liens they have. You don't know that they haven't paid the IRS their taxes for three years. You don't know. So before you take a listing, you, you might find out that your client may be on the verge of short sale or they may be very well upside down. Especially so, nowadays. I'm sorry? I said especially right during after this pandemic. Yes, exactly. And in 2015, there was a lot of that because in 2005, people refinanced or bought homes on the, on the arms that were five, seven, and 10 years. So what happened in 2015? Yep. Those arms, and I had a friend who, hers was 2,400 a month. And on July 1st, 2015, it went to $4,998. <laughs> Jesus. She didn't know it, unfortunately, in her situation, her husband was the one on the loan and he had passed away. <laughs> so, but, you know, it was a shock to find out hers doubled overnight, basically, because it was on, a, a, on an arm. So that's what, you know, you have to guard out for. So when you look and you see someone bought back in, before the crash in the 2000s, hopefully they've refinanced and got out from underneath those arms. Uh, and right now they should have by this point, but... Um, but you don't know. So the first question you have to ask the client is the property, the property is not encumbered by any mortgage or deed of trust, which means they own it free and clear. They paid off the mortgage. And if they say yes to A, it tells you right here, then go down to G. Mm -hmm. If they can't say check off A, then you have to do B, C, D, E, and F. And you have to ask them, who is your lender? What balance do you own? And what type of loan is it? Okay. Okay. Is the property secured by a second deed of trust? Do you have a second mortgage on your home? Do you have a line of credit, home equity line of credit, a HELOC? Are you current on all your payments identified above, B, C, and D? Seller is not in default and has not received any notices from the holders of any loan identified above or from any lien holder of any kind regarding the default under the loan, threatened foreclosure, notice of foreclosure, or filing a foreclosure. Now, if you're meeting with somebody, and I've met with people in this situation, they're on the verge, then, you know, you, you just, you're kind, you're, you're not judging. We all have issues and we all have issues for different reasons. And right now, a lot of people is because of the pandemic and what they're going through. And think of all the the landlords out there right now who aren't getting rent. Yeah. Who owe mortgages and stuff, you know? And so they're all fighting this battle. But, you know, you, you have to know this so you know how to represent them properly, okay? Um, Why is there apprehension to ask the clients these questions? I don't know. Uh, it is just one of those, this is just, even way back in the early 2000s, it's one of these, passages that I was always on the agents about getting answered. It's like, you're, you're fine in answering these. Well, you know, I felt, I felt awkward asking them. I felt awkward getting into their business. That's what they're there. We're anyway, we're here for that. That's exactly. what we're doing anyway. <laughs> it's going to come out because when the title company gets involved, they're going to call you up and say, um, does your client know they need to be bring 30,000 to the table? <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
and woe be to you and the client that doesn't know that and you're in the middle of a deal that could default if they can't bring the money to the table. Mm -hmm. So then you've got liens like state, local, the homeowners association liens, uh, taxes, you know, IRS. If the IRS wants your money, it's, they're not gonna take that lien off. And I think I told you guys about the $25 lien I had against one of those yeah. uh, internet companies who forgot to say that I paid them. And that's, that held up my closing for a couple hours. Um, there, are new, there are no judgments against the seller, including each owner for jointly held property. Seller has no knowledge of any matter that might result in judgments affecting the property. So that could be some non-real estate related. You may owe someone money on something so they've leaned your house, okay? And then bankruptcy. And if they have filed bankruptcy, then uh, they, don't, they don't check on there. And it just depends at the end what happens. You're, you're not advising them about it. You just need to know. But somewhere along the way, it may come up in the title search, okay? There may be some issue with it, okay? In the event property is encumbered by a loan, seller further agrees that the seller shall promptly disclose the name and contact information for the lender and account number to the settlement agent identified in the contract for the sale of the property, okay? So you've asked for it up here, and like Samantha might remember in days of old as agents, as soon as we sent something over to the title company, we would also send part of our email. We would say something like, and here is our clients. So here they no longer have the loan number. Years ago, the loan number used to be here, but that's considered private information now. Uh, but we do want to know who the lender is so we can let the title company know who the lender is. So then if they see a discrepancy come up, then there could be an unreleased lien somewhere. What often happens, and I don't know if you guys have heard this term, it's called a certificate of satisfaction. So um, let's say I sold my home and years ago in the late 1900s, early 2000s, a lot of title companies, once the property was sold and they paid off the mortgage company, the mortgage companies then sent the paid off documents back to the seller with a note that tells the seller, please go record this paid off certificate of satisfaction with the courthouse. Well, sellers are getting these documents that how they, they paid the house off and they're just tucking them away. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so they weren't, weren't recording those deeds. And then what happens when someone goes to buy the house, it could be 20 years later, the title company sees that there's an unreleased lien on the home, which means it shows that it's a zero balance, but for, in order to get clear title, it still says that I have ownership in the property, for example. So in the last 20 years, the title companies have they charge the clients usually around $35 to follow that certificate of satisfaction. $41. $41. <laughs> Depends, yeah. Too, yeah. yeah. Every company's different, but they charge. Well, no, because like the state recording uh, cost in most counties around here is $41. So they usually collect between 20, uh, 42 and 45 for incidental. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it's been a while since I sold here. <laughs> but um, so anyway, so, you know, they followed that process back. Because if you don't give your mortgage company as a seller what your new address and information is, where are they going to send that document to? Back to the house you just sold, right? <laughs> so, Generally, they send them actually back to the title companies now. It seems to be kind of an understood thing. About uh, I'd say about 65% of the releases right. they got were sent to us, and then we then recorded them because it's... Right, you know. exactly. And that's what... And, uh, and I worked for a title company in the late... Uh, in 1998, and... Um, the first two or three weeks I, I had was, um, I had a stack, it was probably over 12 inches high of certificates of satisfaction that were outstanding. Mm -hmm. And I called uh, mortgage companies and past um, sellers and tried to pull all that together and put it on a spreadsheet and make it easily findable. And then we started back then uh, having them sent back to us mm -hmm. and charging the client because it was such a nightmare. Uh, there were so many, um, 
home and being refinanced, kind of like right now, and things would just get lost in the weeds. And then when you come to someone buying a home, it, it stops everything until it gets resolved. And then, you know, when you go to the height of the market, a lot of these companies pop up, little title companies pop up, and then they get out of business. So it's hard to go back and find who the title companies were at that time. So um, all that is part of getting the, that's what the title companies do for us, okay? Seller financing, generally speaking, the answer is going to be no here. <laughs> um, does the seller, does or does not agree to offer seller financing by providing a blank deed of trust loan in the amount of, so if your seller is fully liquid, has the cash, an investor type person, and they want to offer a loan to a buyer, they can certainly do that. There's a separate document that they're going to, you're going to pull in to use. It's very rare that you see it. Um, I, on my land listings in Southern Virginia, um, the seller originally had agreed to seller financing. And, um, but he has since then passed away and his heirs have said no. So, um, but that, you know, uh, where you might also see this is in a family familial situation where a father or parent or aunt or uncle, uh, grandmother, grandparent, whatever, might want to sell a property to uh, a child or a grandchild. And they might do a seller financing where that person is going to pay them back. They're going to build credit up. It's going to be, it's going to be recorded. It's going to be on the deed showing that they have the loan, but it's going to a family member. That's usually where you see them most often used. Okay. Closing costs. Fees for the preparation of the deed of conveyance, that portion of the settlement agent's fee bill to the seller, cost of releasing existing encumbrances, legal, seller's legal fees, grantors tax, and any other proper charges assessed to the seller will be paid by the seller unless provided otherwise in the sales contract. The seller's estimate cost of settlement form is or is excuse me, is or is not attached. So when you meet with your seller, if you don't have it in your hand, what you're gonna to give to them is what their fees are gonna be, then say no, it's not attached. It doesn't mean you can't give it to them later. You can lose close it, you can use the close it in MRIS and bright to, yeah, I said MRIS, bright, uh, MLS. You can use, there's a, they call it close it in there, fill everything in. Um, years ago, we would have a, you know, we would have a hard copy and you would sit there and calculate all the fees and stuff out, but you have to know. And if you do that, you might give it to them with just the title company's information because you don't know what their payoff statement is. Okay. And I would say to my client, and then you would also include what your payoff statement is. Okay. You would know what the commission is in the end, but again, uh, until you know what the commission fee is going to be, it's kind of hard to prepare this ahead of time. And if you're sitting with them with your computer, then you can go in and fill it out. You can email it to them. But more than likely, you're going to say it's not attached, but I would follow up and give it to them. But just don't say it is attached and it's not, and then you don't follow up. And then later on, this becomes an issue between you and your client. I've seen that on more than one occasion. With the client felt that they were being misrepresented because the agent did not do what they said they were going to do. All right, it is 11.04. Let's take a break till 11.10. And um, so everyone can uh, get a drink or whatever. knowing that there may be some more stuff that needs to be ferreted out. Right. So, um, so I'll just reiterate what you asked since it's 1110. So, yeah. so Jeff was asking about these uh, points here on paragraph 21. It's not necessarily a full accurate uh, layout of the person's financial picture. You are doing your due diligence. Um, so you can help your client when you're coming to a sales price, 
and to understand what they're what they're going to receive in the end and if they're going to be upside down or not. And they may already know that they're going to be upside down. They may know this, but they also know that they've got 10 grand in the bank to make up the difference because they owe nine, you know, they're guesstimating. Um, so that's why you're going through this. And at the same time, you have to be strong enough to save your client. Well, you might, looks like you might owe, you know, five to $10,000 in the end at closing in order to close the deal. And they'll say, well, let's just raise it up $10,000. You can't do that. If the market doesn't, doesn't show that it'll sell for that, you can't make up the difference. And it won't appraise for that either, potentially. And it won't appraise for that. And then when you raise it up to 10000 the grantor's taxes go up. Right. So, you know, it, it's kind of a um, domino effect. But it, it helps you understand where they stand financially and that there's nothing missing. Um, and I recently had the situation with my clients. Now, what was interesting was that when I got the notice from the title company, the title company, I, my clients and I both figured up they owed probably about 5000 which was one month's um, mortgage payment. And um, by the, the way the time he was and the time of year because of the taxes. And, uh, but we got this, the uh, preliminary Alta statement from the title company, which by the way was not universal. It was representing the buyers. <laughs> it was 21 grand. And we're like, what? And um, so I'm scrutinizing this statement and I called the title company and I said, I need to explain why you're saying my client's giving your client $20,000 credit. There's no letter. There is nothing about a $21,000 uh, credit. And it was a mistake. Someone at the title company, um, because there was a $200 credit for home inspection items, okay? Mm. Uh, not even a home inspection item, it was a, it was a fan that got broke during the move. So um, my client was reimbursed by the moving company and then instead of going out and buying a fan, they just gave the credit, pass it on to the buyer. Mm -hmm. But the person at the title company had put the wrong amount in there. But then someone else saw that the fan was missing. So they went ahead and put in the credit for the fan as well. So there was a 20 grand and then the 200. <laughs> You know, but that's our job as agents is to scrutinize those documents on behalf of our client, mm -hmm. you know, and for me, when I first saw it, I mean, I was like, just sweated over in a, in a mild panic for about 30 seconds, because I'm thinking, how did I calculate this so badly, <laughs> you know, and so, but it wasn't, you know, I, I had to really scrutinize that Alta statement for accuracy. And, um, but anyway. So thanks for asking for that clarification, Jeff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. So now in a seller's market, and your some of your uh, productivity coaches might suggest this, there are some people who are offering buyers are offering to pay sellers' closing costs, for example, you know, to sweeten the deal for them. So those are some strategies. Before you do that, you need to talk to your coach. Um, your broker to make sure that you're structuring it correctly. Okay. Would I mean, that be all closing? Like the real estate agent fees? I mean, are, are they, are they offering to pay those as well? No, they're offering to pay like taxes. And stuff just like those, just those. Okay. So when they say closing costs, exactly. That's why um, you clarify what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. the, for the seller, that doesn't mean agent fees. Like right. their portion of the agent fee, or well, they they pay all of it technically, but right. It's a desperate what? market. What? <laughs> it's become a desperate market. <laughs> right. What about if you made an offer that said closing costs, and your mind as an agent yeah. you're thinking you're thinking title company fees and yeah. you're thinking tax fees, and the other side thinks oh commissions. Let's agree to it. You know, well that becomes a dispute. That's why you want to reach out to somebody else. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I was a paralegal for many years and both attorneys I worked for, one was in California, one was here, a little over five years each. If they wrote a document, I read it. If I wrote it, they read it. We never sent anything out to the courthouse or to a client or the other person read it. Because what you think makes sense doesn't always make sense to somebody else. Because you already know what you're trying to say 
And you can miss a comma, a simple word, and it can change the whole meaning of the document. So that's why in Virginia, because we're acting kind of like many attorneys in a way, a lot of states, their contracts aren't as detailed as ours. That's why they change a lot because people realize that something's become ambiguous. People are reading it differently than it is intended to be, so they have to change the wording. Well, and the wording is important there because you use the term agent commissions um, versus seller closing costs. But the, the confusing thing is when you look at a HUD, it's all there. Um, so you think of that as the closing document. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that can be super confusing. So I, I totally get your point, Deb, about clarifying what you mean by paying seller closing costs. So I'm glad you guys brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just be very careful when you're doing addendum and addenda and making up language. You know, it's um, when it's, you know, for home inspection, we'll get to that next week. But anything else, check with, you know, check with your leadership, check with Shannon, myself, Steve, if you have to have a decision where you have to make an agreement over something, you know, check with us on how it's being written and what it says to make sure it covers all bases and it makes sense. We'd rather you interrupt us from having dinner than you doing something wrong, okay? So, you know, don't think about what time of day is. If it's urgent, you need to do it. Um, like I told people, I turn my phone off at night at nine and- uh, You said eight. <laughs> well, I moved it up to nine because of the night. <laughs> <laughs> it is easy. <laughs> Sorry, I'll shut up now. <laughs> I try to, but uh, you know, it's like sometimes I have a sixth sense and I wake up at midnight and there's, you know, Andy sending me messages. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, so, right? <laughs> so seller's proceeds. The seller acknowledges that the seller's proceeds may not be available at the time of settlement. The receipt of proceeds may be subject to the section 55.1-903 of the Code of Virginia, commonly referred to as the Virginia Wet Settlement Act, and may be subject to other laws, rules, regulations, Virginia estate statutes, and the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax, FERPTA. Seller is advised to seek legal and financial advice concerning these matters. So in Virginia, we go to closing with the title company or an attorney. Some people use attorneys who work with a title house, which is different than a title company. And then I mean, you go to closing and the documents are signed, buyer and seller sign. So once both parties have signed everything, then it gets recorded with the county. Now in days of old, you physically took the paperwork to the county and turned it in. We have a, now we're doing a lot of online recordings. It's much quicker, but they're still allowed so many days. Samantha, is it still 72 hours? It, yeah, it's kind of like as soon as you can, like um, if it goes beyond that, depending on a holiday or a weekend, or if there's a, right. if one of the counties goes down or something, they're a little more lenient, but yeah, it's basically ASAP. Right, so you normally do it the very next day. Oh, I do a day of, man. Well, right. Well, I mean, if the race to record state, you get that thing on record. <laughs> well, in the days of old, it would be, you know, if you're recording in the morning and you could get your abstract or to get to the courthouse that day, and the, but then the monies you usually weren't released. If it wasn't recorded before three, the monies didn't get released till the next day. So I did that job too. I was, before I worked for this title, or title company, I worked as an abstractor for another one. And my job was to go to like uh, Arlington and Alexandria. And the same thing, yet yeah, you put your stuff in line. Like, and you call back in a few hours to see if it's on record. Then you call the title company and say, hey, disperse your funds. Um, you don't actually get the physical wet signature back for a while um, right. in that way. But online, you get them like, depending on what the courthouse looks like, you can get them in the next hour, so. Right, so right now it's online. So once it's recorded in Virginia, and now it can be the same day. And when you work with title companies like Universal Title, who it's online and they're quick, plus they're just right across the courtyard here in Falls Church, and same with Fredericksburg, they're right close by, uh, whether they take a physical check over to you or they wire the funds, uh, it's, it's pretty quick turnaround. But the seller doesn't get their money, nor does the agents get their commissions 
until it's recorded. In Maryland and DC, they're called dry settlements. Wet settlement means in Virginia, we're, we're waiting for the signatures to dry before anyone gets their funds, okay? You think of it like that. In Maryland, they consider the moment you sign it, it's dry, it's not even recorded. Now, we do not allow you to pick your checks up in Maryland. We don't want you touching commission checks. We want them to come to the office, but they do have a provision that, you know, the it, checks can be negotiated that day, okay? Most title companies usually make sure it goes through the right process and, and make sure all the paperwork's correct before they disperse money. And if you want your money faster, give them wire instructions. Having right. one dispersing monies, give them wire instructions. It's, it's faster, it's easier, it's safer, won't go to the wrong office, you get it the same day. Right. So, and, and that's how we generally work with universal title is on the with wires, both receiving money from the client and sending money to, um, to the office. Um, then the, um, so what happens here is then you, so we have to explain to your seller that, especially if you're closing on a Friday, for example, the earliest they're going to get their money is probably Monday or Tuesday. And you guys may not be aware of it, but Monday is kind of a catch up banking day for the banks. Have you ever, ever looked at your bank account Monday afternoon and stuff you bought on Saturday on Monday still says it's processing? Because they haven't actually reconciled. It's being deducted from your account, but the bank hasn't reconciled it yet. It's got live information there, but it's not been reconciled because they reconcile on Tuesday. So um, sometimes when they're selling on Friday, you know, chances are they might get their money on Monday, but it certainly usually by Tuesday they get their money. But you can't even guarantee that because you're not the title company, but just so you understand. That means though, that in Virginia, when they're at the settlement table, they still have to turn their keys over because it's considered a done deal. It's just that the money doesn't transfer. When you're sitting at the settlement table, if the buyer's money is not there, then we don't, it's not considered a closed deal. You know, we can't, um, the buyer's money has to be in the title company's hand, either by wire or certified funds. Otherwise we can't proceed. So a lot of times, when I know when David will walk into uh, the settlement room, he will confirm with the buyer that um, their funds are there, and you know we can, and, and it lets the other it lets you know that okay, we're good to go. We can proceed with closing. Okay, we've talked about FERPTA a few times, so you have to ask your seller: Are you or are you not a foreign investor? And if they say, yes, I am, say, great. Have you paid the IRS funds? What is your standing with the IRS? Okay. If not, please call the IRS and get the paperwork started. Okay. That's not your job to help them, by the way. The title company will certainly be, once it goes under contract and ratified, the title company will be reaching out to the seller and gathering all the paperwork. But it's not your job to do it for your client, they need to get, you know, the, their situation with the IRS worked out. Okay, seller's duties. Seller represents and warranties. Seller is aware that the seller may be responsible for failing to disclose information and or misrepresenting the condition of the property. Seller certifies the accuracy of the information provided to the listing broker and seller warrants. Seller has a capacity to convey good and marketable title to the property by general warranty deed and represents that the property is insurable by a licensed title insurance company with no additional risk premium. That means everything will be paid off free and clear. They've recognized their debts. See, they're, they're signing this. They're affirming the truth here. Okay, two, seller is not a party to a listing agreement with another broker for the sale exchange or lease of the property. Even though at the beginning of this discussion, you asked them, you said, this is an exclusive between you and me, you're not working with anybody else. Here, this is their duties. They're gonna have to affirm this. No person or entity has the right to purchase, lease, or acquire property by virtue of an option, a right of first refusal or otherwise. So a simple example of the right of first refusal could be that, um, a grandparent uh, has passed away and they've had one grandchild that said, 
when you pass away, I would like to buy your property. Regardless of what the will may say, because the will might be, the money could be divided up between all the grandchildren and the siblings or whatever. But one grandchild has expressed an express interest in that property. That they want to buy that property and the grandparent is fine with it. So that person has the, has the first right of refusal, which means they have the first opportunity to buy that property above anybody else at the fair market value, okay? If they waive the right because they can't afford it at the time, then it can go out to the open market or someone has an option on it. You know, they've, um, some agreement's been written up somewhere along the line. Maybe uh, <clears throat> there's an adjoining property, okay? And uh, farmer A wants to buy farmer's B property. So they have an agreement that if you, you know, die or, or pass away or sell your property, I have the option to buy it before you put it out to anybody else. Okay, so there's an option that's recorded. It's, you know, it's recorded with the county. Everyone knows that someone else has that option to buy that property. Uh, let's see. Seller is or is not an active or inactive agent or broker in whatever state it is. And even if it was 25 years ago, if they were ever an agent, the answer is yes. If they were never ever a real estate agent, the answer is no. Seller has or has not has no knowledge of the existence <laughs> or removals of abandonment of any underground tank on the property. What? So this, this could be a situation where a property was converted and you know, there's been places in Arlington where gas stations have been removed mm. and condos have been built there, right? So, um, you know, it's one of those situations, if it's in their deed that there used to be underground stores, then they're going to have to acknowledge that. Or even in a farm situation, you know, farmers years ago, you would have your, your diesel storage tank, um, and some still do for their farm equipment. Sometimes, you know, the tank's below ground, and then they no longer farm it, so they dug it up. So, you know, someone has to acknowledge that it's been dug up, it's been done properly, and that's what this is about. Deb, would this also be an example of if you had um, a well on the property and let's say it was capped and now you have city water? Um, or is that something different? Or you're talking specifically about a storage? Yeah, you know, we've always, this one doesn't specifically say gas, but some of them have always said oil or gas, you know. Okay. So, yeah. I would say if there was a, it makes sense. I should check that out. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And a Fairfax is capping, making them cap all the wells. Well, in a, in a house I had, it had a well previously, um, but it had been hooked up to city water. And so the well was there. Some people used it for their pools or their yards or whatever, but, um, and then some had them capped off which you couldn't tell unless you knew it was under there. Right, right. Yeah, that, I'll, I'll double check that. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, they, they removed the word gas here. I just realized that. Because it always referred to, used to refer to gas and oil. Um, so then is the property tenant occupied? So you have an investor who's selling their property. You have to know if it's tenant occupied. Then you need to see a copy of the lease. You need to work with the tenant and the landlord when you're listing the property, the tenant has their rights according to the lease. So this is four months before the tenant's lease is due. The lease says 60 days. You can certainly sign a listing agreement now. You can certainly start working toward getting the property listed. But the listing agreement says 60 days before the end of the lease to show property and stuff, right? So that's why you wanna, what is, what is the listing agreement? What does the lease actually say? Okay. And then you want to work with the tenant to make sure that um, um, you know they know what's going on as well. So, how would that work? In, okay, say you 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 listed the property and everything. You're doing open houses, and there's a tenant in the basement. Um, that would be. I mean, I don't know. Like if the, if the tenant. Like, what if the tenant is not willing to cooperate as far as, like, <laughs> stepping up for, like, the open house and stuff 
you know what I mean? So Rayquan's question is, so there's a tenant in the house and they're not willing to cooperate here in open houses. Yeah, that's a conversation that the seller, the landlord and the tenant need to discuss because their agreement says they have to cooperate okay. with reasonable requests. So if you give them a week's notice, you're going to open a house and you're asking them to be away from the home for three hours. Now if they say, why well, work nights and I sleep till noon? Okay, then you don't have your open house until two to four type thing. Um, but no, they're supposed to cooperate. There are a lot of tenants that don't cooperate. There's a lot of tenants who leave the house in atrocious mess because they don't want to move. They don't want the house to sell. They don't want to move. Uh, you're going to run into all, this is one of those situations that I said when I opened the door with my client, I'm like, yeah, we don't want to go in here, <laughs> you know, um, or it's so bad. Well, especially now, I mean, the tenants didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic possibly and now they're being asked to let people in the house right so there was a one of our agents probably about three or four years ago had a listing off of uh, route seven a big single family home you know the rental was i think it was 4500 thereabouts a month but the tenants in the house were just not clean people so the landlord and it just put people off because people are coming to buy a house that's you know, 800 and some thousand or whatever. And um, it's messy inside, you know, it didn't present well. So that landlord making a made an agreement with the tenants that if they kept the place clean and presentable or even hire a cleaning company, she reduced their rent by so much money. And long as she didn't get complaints about the condition of the home, then, you know, and they, they wrote up an agreement, the landlord and the tenant not the agent, the agent was not involved because that agent was not involved in that relationship. But it was something that, you know, the, the landlord, you know, the agent came to us and said, this is the issue we're having. And we said, well, you can suggest this to the landlord, but you need to make sure the landlord and the tenant make up the agreement that the brokerage is not party to that because we were, the brokerage was not party to that lease. Okay. And that worked and they were able to sell the house. Hmm. But, um, you know, each situation is different. Um, again, sometimes you might, because people, what they say is, well, even when they're like, they're, even if it's going to be released, why well, do I want to lose a month's lease? Well, if you've got an uncooperative tenant, you might have to wait till they get out and clean the place up before someone even consider giving you 2000 a month to live there, you know? So um, yeah, you, you're going to run into uncooperative sellers as well. But again, it's your job as an agent to help them understand that the buyer has to have privacy when viewing the homes. People coming in need to have privacy. Can I help you? Oh, just trash, okay. <laughs> um, the people coming in need to have privacy during an open house. You know, the worst thing you want to do is have your seller sitting on the couch, <laughs> you know, while people are in, trying to see an open house, people are uncomfortable. Everybody's uncomfortable. Same with the home inspection. The seller should not be there for the home inspection, nor should the listing agent, because the buyer and their agent and the inspector should have the option to have privacy in their conversations. Again, you don't want to discuss strategy in the home because you don't know if there is recording device that they haven't declared, so be careful about that. Which brings us into number seven, is there, is there not recording devices, okay? Uh, seller understands that the recording of audio may result in violations of state and federal wiretapping laws. Therefore, seller hereby releases and holds harmless the broker. So if they're lying about the teddy bear in the kid's room <laughs> not being a recording device, <laughs> you know? Or a Zoom doorbell. That's something I actually ran to yeah. recently. My, my yeah, so there's a doorbell. Listen to everyone on the front porch. Right. So you got to remember those Zoom doorbells and stuff. A ring, not Zoom. Sorry, derp. Yeah, Z, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, those ones that take pictures and record stuff and, you know. Can I ask why you're continuing to follow me around with that teddy bear? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> All those candy cams and stuff. I mean, they've got so sophisticated now. Um, we went in one home before this was law where you where you had to declare it. And so as we walked in, we're like, 
And that was a little tiny townhouse, two bedrooms, and every room had cameras. Wow. You, know, you just felt like you're being watched every wow. step, and it was in the place was vacant too. But uh, you're just like, okay. And um, so cool. there's a movie called The Accountant. I'd recommend it to yeah. everyone. <laughs> great, great flick. I that, like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, did you see it? I have it, but Raekwon has. Oh, it's it's good, and and you'll you'll uh, you'll be able to relate to it just so <laughs> watch the movie. I won't spoil it though. Okay. <laughs> so access to the property, seller shall provide keys to the broker for access to the property to facilitate broker's duties under this agreement. Seller shall allow brokers and licensed assistants in the property to perform ministerial acts as defined in that law. If property is currently tenant occupied, shall seller shall provide broker with any current lease documents, which we just talked about, contact information for the current tenant and shall use best efforts to obtain the full cooperation of the current tenant in connection with the showings and inspection of the property. So what better thing to do for yourself is give that tenant a $25 gift card to go to the movies. <laughs> well, pre-COVID. <laughs> you know, go out to eat, you know. Um, I always tell my clients, and I don't know who I got this idea from, could have been Buffini or somebody, but the first weekend that a house goes on the market, it's crazy. You can't even sit down to eat without someone in a busy seller's market. So I always ask, do you have family or friends in the area that you could go stay with? Because this is what's going to happen. And you'd paint a picture for them. You're going to be at home, and we said there's an hour lead time, and you're middle of cooking dinner. And you want to sell your house. So what do you do? <laughs> you know, you know, do you stop cooking and put everything away and leave? Uh, do you say no, come, in, come an hour later, but then the people can't come back? You know, if someone's really interested, they're going to come back. But when you as buyer's agents are trying to schedule showings, you can see where that becomes kind of an issue. You know, you have two or three properties over here and you're trying to see them in like 20 minute increments. And then you got one way over here and all of a sudden the middle person here says you can't see it for another hour. So then you're going one, three, four, <laughs> two, you know. So that's where you, so some people are never both sides. They've only ever done listings. They've only ever done buyers. So you don't see both sides of the coin. So there's issues for both parties. It's hard for the buyer's agent scheduling, but it's also hard for the sellers, not the listing agent per se, but the sellers and um, knowing that their home is going to be invaded. Uh, my home that I sold in Pimmon Hills in 2017, I think we were maybe live on the market for about 36 48 hours max and um, before it went under contract. And in the few showings we had, we had quite a few showings that first day um, and we started, you know, the offers were coming in. My daughter and I had to leave the house, you know, throughout the day multiple times. You know, we just went over to Lido's there and watched movies on the iPad <laughs> and had lunch. We came home Someone had sat on my bed. Someone had lifted the covers up off my bed. Why? Um, yeah. Um, they had um, touched stuff in my daughter's room. They had changed the, so this was in April. They had turned my heat up to 80 degrees. Wow. Right. This is a 1300 square foot rambler. But like why? I called those agents. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, my clients got away from me. I'm like, how do you get away from me? How does your clients get away from you in a 1300 square foot rambler? <laughs> how can you not see that your client is messing with my HVAC? This is not a home inspection. You have no right to mess with my system. Why were your clients sitting on my bed? Why did they lift up my comforter? Right? You know, and you can always expect someone's going to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you know, you can't help the call of nature. They're not supposed to lay in your bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so was, but my daughter, I can remember her saying to me, she's like, she's 16. She goes, mama, I feel so violated. And so I tell that story to my clients because 
stuff like this can happen. You know, you're going to come home and sometimes find things that shouldn't be left in your commode, you know, because someone's kids are with them. Now with COVID, it's kind of changed a little bit. But before that, I was, I was holding a house open in Arlington uh, last year. And um, the parents, you know, we were talking to the parents and all of a sudden the little boy ran. And next thing we know, we hear the commode flushing, you know, um, neither one of the parents reacted to, I kind of paused my speech, hoping they would go after the child but they didn't, you know, little three-year-old door wide open, <laughs> building an open house, you know, doing his thing. Um, but, you know, I always carry supplies with me, even pre-COVID, and I just go in there and wash it down. I always check the toilets, the doors before I leave an open house to make sure that no one has opened a window. That was the other thing they did at my house. They opened the window and left it open. Um, so, and same with agents, when you're showing homes, guys, you're not so, if you go out the back door to, onto a deck and the door was locked, make sure you lock it when you come back in. Right. That's your job. Okay. You don't leave it unlocked. Now, when I go into a house and all the lights are on, I always send a note to the agent and say, by the way, all the lights are on. And if, if, first, I look at the listing and the listing might say all lights are on. Now, and especially in COVID, that's kind of what people are doing. All lights are on, leave them on. Great. Okay. But if I go into a house and all the lights are on, I always double check with the agent in case someone else had been there before me. I notice all the lights are on. Does your client want them left on? You know, because I'm the last one there, right? So I don't want to be the one that they're coming after saying, you left all the lights on. So I always just double check with the agent, give them a quick text, and then I turn them off if I need to. Otherwise, I'll leave them on. I've been, I've shown property where you walk in and someone's computer is up and their business is up on the computer because they have ran out of the house. You know, that might be the person I see walking the dog on the street. They could very well be the owner of the house. They're working from home or they're doing something and they run out of the house so you can come in. You know, I've had TVs left on, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then worse yet, people in beds. So, um, yes, you will find that. that well, you will come across your person in the bed one day. <laughs> um, even when you've knocked and screamed, I, I always do it like a ho like a hotel maid coming in, you know, housekeeping. It's like, hello. As I'm opening the door, I'm like knocking, hello, ringing the bell, hello, you know, real estate agent. And um, and we and we've had people, you know, surprised that we're there because the TV's so loud or whatever. Um, so it happens. Okay. Sellers assuming all risks. Seller retains full responsibility for the property, including all utilities, maintenance, physical security, and liability until the title to the property is transferred to the buyer. Seller is advised to take all precautions for safekeeping of valuables and maintaining appropriate property and liability insurance through the seller's own insurance company. Broker is not responsible for the security of the property or for, the, or for inspecting property or any specific basis on any specific, periodic basis. Uh, if property is or becomes vacant during the listing period, seller is advised to notify seller's homeowner's insurance company and request a vacancy clause to cover the property. It depends on their insurance company, okay? So when you have a seller who's vacated the property, you tell them to call their insurance company. One of my clients said, as long as there's a folding chair in the house, we don't consider it vacant, you're fine. Okay. Other companies say if no one's staying in the house at all, it's considered vacant. You're not fine. You have to have a separate waiver. So everyone's individual company is different. Their policy, how they, how long they've had their policy, everyone's different. Okay. So you want to make sure there again, if your clients have vacated the property, you as an agent are not responsible to keep an eye on that property for security and safety. You know, they should rely, you know, they should ask someone to help them like a neighbor or somebody, but you as a listing agent is there to uh, check on the house to make sure your stuff's taken care of, your sign's in good shape. And by the way, guys, when we have storms like we have, you know, it's hurricane season and you have a listing, go and check on your signs. Go and check on your signs. Um, signs get beat up terribly during hurricanes. Sometimes you might go take your signs off that night if a storm's coming through and put them back up. One thing that my husband did for me was, um, so you have the two holes at the top of the sign, like if this is the sign, you know, you have your two holes up here at the top. Uh, 
So what he did for me was he drilled a hole down here and using the, um, those, uh, what are they called? Little tie things, you know, you see police officers use instead of handcuffs, I forgot zip the ties. zip ties. Yeah, thank you. Um, two of those together can go around that pole that keeps that um, sign from, because like my list is down the country, they're, you know, far away. And that has kept them from flopping around during the storms and stuff. So that's one of the things to do. Um, in consideration, paragraph two of the use of broker services and facilities and the facilities of any MLS seller and seller's heirs and assigns hereby release the broker, broker's designated agent, sub-agent, sales associates, and employees and all MLS and directors, officers, employees thereof, including officials of any parent association of realtors, except for malfeasance, if you do something wrong, on the part of each party, from any liability to the seller for vandalism, theft, or damage, or any nature, what, any nature, what, whatsoever to the property or its contents that occurred during the listing period. Seller waives any and all right claims and causes of action against them and holds them harmless for any property damage or personal injury arising from the use or access of the property by any persons during the listing period. So if a buyer falls down the steps and breaks their leg, it's not the broker's fault. They cannot sue the brokers on either side. If the buyer sues the seller in a lawsuit, the brokers cannot be brought into it or the MLS or anybody else, okay? So we've already gone over this stuff here when it comes to the buyer's agreement. You know, you cannot give professional advice if you're not being retained as their attorney, their CPA or whatever. Uh, if you wanna give them provider's information, like you're gonna refer Joe's Flagstone and Landscaping. Like I could say to you guys, Joe's Flagstone and Landscaping has been used by 10 agents here in our office. They've done a great job. You know, uh, I'll be glad to give you some referrals if you need them. But, um, you know, I'm not guaranteeing that what they do for you particularly is, uh, you know, is gonna meet your needs. You need, to re you need to talk to them, explain what your needs are, and then they will uh, let you know if they can do that job or not, okay? I cannot be re held responsible for something that Joe's Flagstone and Landscaping doesn't do properly on someone's property. They can do 10 properties, perfect, and everyone's happy, and that 11th one, something could go wrong, okay? Okay, so subsequent offers after contract acceptance. After a sales contract has been ratified on the property, Broker recommends seller obtain the advice of legal counsel prior to acceptance of any subsequent offer. This is outside of when someone is doing active under contract, which means they're accepting backup offers. This is when you've got a ratified offer that's pending and someone comes along and says, hey, Raekwon, how much is someone paying you for your house? Oh, 500,000. You cancel with them, I'll pay you, I'll give you 525 tomorrow. I'll pay cash. Okay. Before Raekwon can take my offer, he should seek legal counsel because he is in a contractual agreement with that buyer. Okay. He can't just say, oh, you're, you're, we're done. Well, there's no legal recourse. Okay. So if you have a son that comes to you and says, can we get rid of this buyer and take another offer? Because people in this market will, I've heard stories about buyers knocking on sellers' homes <laughs> themselves, um, trying to see if they can, uh, what they can do to get the, their deal in. So if you represent sellers, tell them they should not be talking to anyone but you. They need to give, give them a stack of your cards and say, here, call my agent, here, call my agent, okay? People are getting very bold. Uh, governor, governing laws, Guess what? It's the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's the laws of Virginia that we're abiding by and federal law. Uh, binding agreement. This agreement will be binding upon the parties, meaning the buyer and seller, not the brokers, and each of their respective heirs, executors, administrators, successors, and permanent assigns, permitted assigns. The provisions hereof will survive the sale of the property and will not be merged therein. 
This agreement, unless amended in writing by the parties, contains the full and entire agreement of the parties and will not be bound and will not be bound by any terms, conditions, and statements, warranties, and representations not herein contained. So the basic agreement is this one document, and then you start adding your addenda to it that becomes part and parcel to the whole. We talked about attorney's fees, additional items. Again, here, additional terms. Again, here, if you're gonna write something up that really needs your broker to overlook your shoulder to make sure it makes sense and no one's getting harmed. But if it's like pool table can convey for free, you can write that in there. Pool table conveys for free. You're gonna put that in my last pool table conveys for free. Oh, by the way, that does not mean a buyer has to take it. A buyer can reject the albatross around the neck, okay? They can say, uh, no, <laughs> you know. Uh, a couple years ago, one of the students in class, and he says, yeah, we're my wife and I are buying a house and the pool table's for free. And I said, uh, I want you to go home tonight and call companies and ask them how much it costs to remove a pool table. He came in and said, oh yeah, we're not taking the pool table. <laughs> His wife didn't want it, he wanted it. He didn't play pool, but he thought it was a great idea to have a free pool table. I said, find out how much it costs to get rid of it before you agree to keep it. Um, same with pianos nowadays and, and other things. So be careful. Exercise uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Huh? Exercise equipment. Yes, that too. Exercise equipment. That stuff is heavy and it's costly to get moved. You know, especially when someone brings something into a basement and then builds walls around it. <laughs> you know? I, I, I've known people who've had to take door frames down. They've had to take railings off the stairwell to get things out. And in fact, as listing agents, if you go into someone's basement and you're looking at the freezer in the basement, yeah, and you say, are you going to take that freezer with you? Yeah, but we don't know how we're going to get it out of here. And you measure and it's like, yeah, okay. Well, it looks like you're going to take the door frame down and you're going to have to remove the railing, but all that has to be repaired before we put it on the market. Mm -hmm. So you need to get that freezer out now, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. What's full of food? Find someone to hold it for you, but it, it needs to come out now. Because you don't want to get the house on the market, then have someone move the freezer, the door frame comes down, the rails come down, and all of a sudden someone's showing up for a home inspection. Okay. So um, again, just like with the buyer's agreement, your information, your, this is where you're memorialized. If you're part of a team, that information goes there. Broker, it's going to auto-populate auto populate KW9 ed, but then you're gonna put a text box here and you're gonna put either Shannon Lauderstein or Angela. And then down here it's gonna pre-populate the brokerage's email. And then you're gonna put a text box and then you're gonna either next to it or underneath it and put Shannon and Angela's information down. Okay. So next week is Mega Camp. Uh, We've gone through, this is the one of the documents that's not part of the buyer's agreement, but it's what the buyer signs. Now the buyer, remember, got the four page document stating what this document is telling them it's stating here in the hyperlink, okay? But this is what all the sellers have to sign. And as you see, they're just simply saying that the purchaser advised to consult the residential property disclosure statement on the webpage. Now we have to give it to the buyer. Because people weren't doing that for information about the disclosures required by law that may affect the buyer's decision to purchase the real property described above. This is where the legal description goes. It's the property address, 1234 Main Street, and the legal description. Lot five, block three, subsection two, whatever, if there's a legal description in MLS, then it should go there. The seller signs this. This is part of your documents you're gonna put in MLS online for the buyer's agent to bring down, okay? Same with your lead-based paint, okay? This document here, the federal lead-based paint document, I'm not gonna read it to you, welcome to read it on your own. It's just all the rules and laws about the lead-based paint. This is not the disclosure that goes to the buyer. This is the federal disclosure that goes to the seller. This is part of your listing package. It does not go to the buyer, okay? They've made it such tiny print so they could get it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It used to come on legal paper. Okay, then, uh, but it is part of your listing agreement. 
This is also part of the listing agreement, but this is part of what the buyer and the both agents have to sign, okay? So here, your seller, unless they actually know, have, unless they actually have knowledge, absolute knowledge that there is lead-based paint in those walls because it's been tested and they know it, then they would say, yes, it has lead-based paint and they have knowledge. So you would say, you would check here. So it's, it's kind of, this is one of those forms I wish they just put a space bar, a space, but it's because of the amount of documents. But see here, this B and this A goes to this thing here. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, A is here, B is here. So it's this, these two boxes here. A goes here, B is here. I'm sorry, I misspoke there. So these two boxes pertain to this here, initials. These two boxes pertain to this one. So in most cases, you're going to have the seller has no knowledge, which is the second one, and they have no reports. Now, if they have no knowledge, they shouldn't have any reports, right? Doesn't make sense. Consequently, if they do have knowledge, then they should have reports. <laughs> so most likely, you're going to see no knowledge and no reports, okay? Then, as listing agents, Those listing agents, you're going to initial here, your seller's going to sign and date, and you're going to sign and date, okay? Then you post this online for the buyer's agent to download it, and then when, then when they're making an offer, they're going to read this, and it says, purchaser has received an opportunity to review the copies of the information listed above. So if the seller has checked no knowledge and no reports, then the buyer does not initial C because there is nothing that they've received, okay? You are going to have agents come back and tell you that your clients have forgot to initial C. That's when you say, oh, did you provide reports for us? I'm sorry, I missed those. <laughs> Try not to sound sarcastic like I do. <laughs> it's like, because most agents don't read this. They've been told initial, 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 check mark, check the second box. They don't know what it says. So if no and no is checked, then buyer does not initial here. They've not received anything. Buyer has received a pamphlet marked yes, so they would initial here. Buyer has checked one below. Now here's another situation where I find initials here, but I don't find the check here. So you have to go back and say, does your clients want to do a lead-based paint inspection or are they waiving the opportunity? Chances are they're going to waive the opportunity, but every now and again, they're going to want to do an inspection. Then as the buyer's agent, you're going to initial here. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you initial here. No, but down below, seller's on the left and buyer's on the right. Why not be consistent? Okay, and then the purchaser would then sign and then the selling or buyer's agent signs and this becomes part of the offer, okay? We're almost done, guys. Give me another minute. So that, so that there's two. Um, yeah, we're done. Go ahead. Where it has, uh, where it has the um, seller disclosure and the purchaser's acknowledgement. Under the seller's disclosure, does it, so the sellers, um, why are there two spaces there for each one? Is that if there's two okay, sellers? There's two questions. That's the, that's the confusing part. So here it says, presence of lead-based paint and or lead-based paint hazard, check one. Known lead-based paint. I would check that. See, it's A. That's what I'm saying. They need a space in here, but because of the amount of documents. Well, that too, but where you initial, do, where the seller's initial, they've got two spaces for that. Is that so? Oh, well, two sellers. Okay. And, and if then, four sellers, you would just do, you know, one and one, you know, whatever. Below. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. And it's, so they, they really should be um, answering both A and B. They correct. Should be, okay. Right, A and B, right. Now, going back to your table of contents, because we've already gone over these other documents, we're gonna do it again. Yeah. But you remember, you have to add your ABA and your cyber notice as well, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so we're off next week. So you've got a whole week between doing Megacamp. Jeff, of course, 
trying to be the pet, uh, has already done the um, contract. But of I want, course he has. <laughs> but I want you guys to take a stab at make, writing a, a, a contract. So you can use the property that you did your listing agreement for. You know, make a family member or someone, or if you have two email addresses, you know, make yourself two different names. And you re you're a buyer and a seller. If, you know, Wonder Woman and, you know, Mr. Marvel or whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to do. And um, Batman and Robin. <laughs> exactly. And go through <laughs> and go through and um, and try to do an offer. Okay. So okay. Have actual listing in hand. And when you look at your table of contents here. Um, so we're going to be acting as the buyer making an offer on a property. We're going to be acting as both parts, right? Oh, okay. You're going to make an offer and um, and you're going to sign off on it or look at it, you know, so do both parts. Okay. So to make an offer, so well, let's just keep it simple then. Let's just pretend like you are the buyers. Okay. You're the buyer's agent. And you're making an offer. So you go to page 38. Okay. Then you've got on your table contents, you've got this, the first thing you have is a residential sales contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you have to decide, say, so look at the property that you're going to write the offer on. And that's going to dictate to you whether you need lead-based paint, well, septic, whatever. Okay. Uh, then let's pretend that the seller has been a nice seller and has put uh, the documents online. Now, if you want to go to MLS and choose a listing from one of our offices, certainly do that. That's a way to see if that listing agent's doing their job and putting their uh, deep pour and lead-based paint stuff up there, okay? Um, then are you going to do home inspection? And if so, what? And then you work through your packages. If you go down to your miscellaneous documents, that's where all your other documents are. Now, one of the things I would hint for you to do is when I'm writing an offer, the first thing I do is um, I go to paragraph 39 here. Mentally and oftentimes physically, I go here and I look and I think about the listing I'm making an offer on, what my client's desires are, and then I say, okay, I need home inspection. They don't want to do a lead-based inspection. And oh, by the way, it's not lead-based. Okay, check that no. These are yes and no. You do have to answer yes or no here. Mm -hmm. Do I have any contingencies other than home inspection? So I look at my contingencies and clauses. Maybe my client has to sell their house. So you go down this list and answer yes or no. The residential disclosure is what you get from the seller. Is it there? You need it, but is it there? If it's not there, you need to contact the listing agent, ask them to send it to you because they didn't put it online. Okay. And then when they do send it to you, see what date it is. That their client signed it, choosing the day you asked for it. Um, then what type of financing is it? Okay. Um, and then the well and septic. And you don't know there's going to be post settlement because you're the one making the offer. That would probably <laughs> might come from the listing side. And then you'll know by the age if there's going to be lead based paint or not. And if there's this type of financing, is there anything else like a FERPTA addendum, for example? Okay. So this is kind of where I start to pull my package together in command. And then I, you know, input all my clients information. I input all the property information, let it autofill. And then I go and I cut and paste from the tax record, all the other information. Wherever I'm autofilling, I always cut and paste as much as I can, less chance of making a mistake. Okay. All right, with that said, you guys, Enjoy boot, uh, enjoy mega camp next week, not boot camp. And um, we will, but still feel free to call and contact me if you have any questions.